Okay. Can you, do you hear me? Okay. I guess some of you are confused. I'm not Konstantinos Antonio. I'm not as tall as him, and yeah, maybe not as charming as him. Um, so he had to leave, so I'm substituting for him. And I'll present you uh, what we got from the Big Data and Travel Workshop. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention from the beginning is that we exercised a lot the concept of diverging and a little bit the concept of converging. Maybe not as much converging, but diverging was there a lot. Um, the things that we tried to do was, first of all, start by defining the concept of big data in transport, um, which is not as easy as it might sound. Uh, then we tried to to, to help ourselves by defining, let's say, cases of big data use, um, try to derive research questions based on these discussions we had, and finally, uh, we tried to set some priority access for research. Uh, starting from, yeah, one thing that I think is mentioned and we should mention is that Costas Goulias um, told us that we should try and map the travel behavior genome, and we, we think that probably big data can help do that. Um, starting from the definition and the problems that we, we, we had is that what exactly is big data for transportation analysis? And um, we all have heard the various Vs that exist, but then we started discussing maybe um, not all Vs apply in transportation, could it be only two or three of them? And essentially, we went into, um, let's say, uh, the concept of philosophy, are we, as, we, as we defined it, where we said that, yeah, maybe volume is important and velo velocity, but maybe not all of them. So the questions that uh, were raised during this definition was that, do we need all these Vs? Um, maybe it it, it, this is related to the fact that data should be passively collected. Maybe the discontinuity of data means that this is not big data. Shall we change our models and maybe this means that this is, you know, big data or not? Is big data all about size or should all the, some other things be considered? Um, should we, should only continuity uh, uh, means that this is big, or is there a threshold, for example, of complexity that makes data big? Um, we, didn't have, we don't have answers for these questions, and I don't think that we should look for these answers. The, the thing is that we, we, we then tried to, um, let's say, help ourselves by identifying the data sets that in, we use mostly in transportation. And these are telecommunication data, GPS data, social media data, the, 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 vehicle, the, the, sensor, the vehicle sensors data, track and trace data, smart card data, and app-based data collection data. One thing that is common in every single one of these cases is that they all uh, came from, let's say, the, um, the, the explosion that we had with, within the digital era, right? Uh, before a few years, this, this data was not available to us, uh, but with the information technology, this, this started to arise as a concept. And in some cases, it caught us out of surprise. What do we do with this data? So essentially, this led to some interesting questions and, some, and allowed us to formulate some interesting needs. Um, with the first one to be that we, we, we discussed it a lot and we said that probably we should not throw away what we have been doing so many years. Um, and and the, 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 the obvious need is uh, getting away from like the, the, the data intensive processes or essentially doing that, but trying to integrate and fuse what we get from the traditional, let's say, models and the traditional uh, data that we have um, with, with the big data. Um, the second one is that in many cases, and this has been mentioned before uh, from the other workshops, in many cases, we actually don't know what we will find from the data that we get. And uh, this is a, a question that 
we discussed a lot in the sense that people tend to ask, why do you need the data? And the answer in many cases is that we don't really know. We just need to, to have the data in order to identify patterns and concepts and thus use data-driven approaches to see what we can get out of it. The third, let's say, starting point or need is that what we usually do is we try to describe the average day, the typical day, the average individual, and so on, which is something that came from, let's say, the, 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 the data that was available to the researchers, and that now that we investigate more and more uh, larger quantities of data, we find out that this doesn't exist. The typical day, for example, doesn't exist. So this need was, let's say, very clear to us that we should try and find methodologies and adjust what we are doing so that we, we address this concept of non-regularity, essentially. The, the, uh, I have two more. The, the next one is like the, the, the need that we, essentially we, we receive data from different sources, and these are heterogeneous data. In order to analyze and understand what these mean, um, we need different types of visualization. And finally, we had this discussion about what will happen if we try uh, to use this like, big data with our, the conventional approaches we have. And do we need to you know, change that? Do these approaches that we use cater for scalability and so on? So obviously, we need to find out if we could do that. And we, the only way to do that is using validation. Um, so there were quite a lot of research, uh, quite many research questions that were formulated during this discussion. And um, we, in the end, picked some of them to present as, let's say, research projects. Um, the, the, the first one was, how much data do we need? And this is very related to the how much precision is enough uh, for our applications. Um, the other one was, can we approach anomaly detection and better understand this halo effect that we have? And this was mentioned, I think, in another, uh, in another description, that we need to study the transition um, that we get, we have. And maybe um, we have this opportunity using big data. Um, the other one is, Nowadays, we, we, we might be able to, to shift from like this average perspective that we were talking and going towards more real-time data analytics for operational decision making. Um, then it, the question came that, OK, you're, we are discussing everything and everything seems perfect. Shouldn't there, aren't there some limitations of this big data? And um, can they be used? for everything or, you know, shouldn't we try to see, where to, to test their limits? I have a few, a few more. Um, one thing that was clear to us because we were, tra we were discussing about tra uh, travel behavior was uh, what is going on with attitudinal, dat attitudinal data and if big data could be used to, to, to understand that. And then, um, can longitudinal update be enhanced by big data? Can big data be used for cross-sectional data enrichment? And what is going on essentially with privacy? And um, out of these many, many questions, we selected a few that we thought that are both kind of like natural to pursue for the next few years. Uh, and. Um, were these that attracted, let's say, most of our discussions. The first one is how much data do we need and how much precision. The longitudinal update was also something that was discussed very much. Cross-sectional data enrichment and privacy, these are the four. Starting from, let's say, how much data we need, um, we thought that this is kind of a clear project for us, that, or maybe many clear projects that 
essentially we need guidelines because in many cases people come and ask, um, is a 15 minute in, minutes interval uh, sufficient for your application? Is, uh, is, is a, f a f sampling interval? Um, or maybe how many sensors do you need? Um, and all these questions are very relevant, let's say, to um, to, to, to other, let's say, to, to the fact that, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe, let's say, every five minutes in, is enough. And um, so we, we thought that we have three approaches to pursue. One is like start from a great data set that has a, a very, let's say, high sampling rate and go towards, let's say, feature selection. The other one is to try and empirically estimate the impact of these characteristics to the application. And the last one, and probably the easiest to do, is try to uh, perform simulation studies in order to get, let's say, the impact of the data characteristics to the application. For example, if you want to see the impact of um, GPS sampling, you could do a simulation study where you know exactly the trajectory and then uh, try to do to to examine different sampling rates um, so that you understand the impact that it has. The second one um, was the, the cross-sectional data enrichment. And here, um, let's say, the idea was that, okay, travel surveys should not go away. We are, we are very comfortable with this. Um, but maybe during the, the period of time that the travel survey is performed, different types of data should be also collected, and we should try to match and co connect, let's say, these different data sources together um, so that we have, uh, let's say, yeah, so, so, that, so that these are linked together and the, the travel survey is enriched and so on. Um, this, of course, passes through um, data fusion and integration methods that we don't some exist, but I guess we don't have them like so something standard. And um, then again, we, we discussed this within this, let's say, project area, the, the concept of typical and average behavior. And uh, the, the, the third one, the longitudinal update using big data, the main idea was that essentially we are getting um, the travel surveys every few years. In the same time, in between these years, there are changes that maybe we observe or, or we expect, but usually, you know, it's blank in between. We have no idea. So we could use other sources to update, let's say, the results from the travel survey every, you know, periodically, or if it's a streaming uh, data, if it's streaming data, we could do that quite often. Um, and in this way, we essentially would be prepared for changes, and in the same time, we would have something that is updated every now and then. Um, for that, again, we, we need to, to visit like the first, um, the, 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 we, we, we need to do that, we need to integrate the cross-sectional, let's say, data enrichment, so that we have something that represents the same thing, um, formulate an update process, and finally, finding methods to, to see how we integrate the updates we get from the big data in the travel survey. On privacy, we discussed it, and I think other groups discussed it, this as well. I will, will not take a lot of time. Um, but big data is very much related to what is shared and what, is, um, what, what users allow us to use and what some companies have. Uh, so this is something that should not be left out when we are doing all these discussions with big data. Um, and maybe we could think of um, acceptable limits of data aggregation. We should talk about data ownership and the use of people's data by researchers and authorities and open data structures and people attitudes towards privacy. This is all from me. Um, we think that, yeah, big data can help our quest here, probably. But we have a quote that was added last minute in the presentation. This is a quote by 
Dan Ariely on what big data is. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any question for Manus? Yes. Only, uh, I agree with almost everything you said. The only difference for me would be that if you go to a data conference, uh, we are not talking anymore of typical data or data every so many years. We're talking of ongoing data. And there is a difference there, but still big data can help. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. Did you? Yes. Yeah, I have a very general question, but because I, I mean, I heard that big data is everywhere that are uh, around us, but like as a researcher, one of the main challenge I have is to have access to a large data set and not using data set that are uh, from 1999. Uh, so the question is, can we, do, did we discuss if we can again be inspired by what's happening in machine learning with the UCI uh, machine learning repository and to create similar things for the discrete choice community? We discussed a lot about the methods and the data collection techniques uh, and all these changes that happen in different communities because most of these, let's say, are happening in, uh, in communities that are, are not ours. <laughs> and what we usually do is that we tend to, um, to, to, to use these, these tools and these, let's say, databases and so on uh, and uh, adjust that with the domain expertise we have and, um, you know, correct for the problems that maybe they were not there, um, that they, they couldn't identify. Um, but we thought that that's not, let's say, um, the main focus uh, that we should have, like, um, uh, on, on the methodologies. We should test all these, let's say, machine learning techniques, um, but we should also understand and see if our tools uh, could 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 work for that. Excellent. Thanks, Renos. Just let's thank you.